Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Monsignor John Foster. I am the Vicar General and moderator of the Coria for the Archdiocese for the Military Services USA. Our offices are located in Washington, D.C., but we really are a global archdiocese. Uh, we uh, have 1.8 million men, women, and children that counted among our number. Uh, the men and women are generally active duty military personnel and their de dependents. Uh, we also include patients who are in VA medical facilities, 153 of those in the U.S., as well as government employees who are stationed outside the borders of the United States of America. So we, the sun never sets on the Archdiocese of Military Services. <laughs> Wherever our military personnel are, so are we. Uh, I have taught for six years at the Catholic University of America in the School of Canon Law, a sacramental liturgical law, uh, which came out of my love of liturgy when I was uh, really before the seminary. And when I was my, my home diocese of Stockton, I was director of the Office for Worship um, for about seven or eight years, as well as other duties as assigned in small dioceses. So um, I've been intimately involved with the RCA process and with its canonical aspects. The right of Christian initiation of adults is first and foremost a liturgical process. It's about liturgy. It comes from the name right, or the Latin ordo. And as such, the RCAA <coughs> is governed by liturgical law. And liturgical law is part of canon law. Yes, the RCAA has an important and constitutive element in catechesis. And for that reason, it's also mentioned in the Code of Canon Law in Book 3 of the Code, one teaching office. But there are a couple of important canonical issues we to get right off the bat that really govern the RCAA as a whole. And the first is the interrelationship of baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. Canon 842, paragraph 2 of the 83 Code says, I'll give you the text in your handout, the sacraments of baptism, confirmation, and the Most Holy Eucharist are interrelated in such a way that they are required for full Christian initiation. Now notice, it's full Christian initiation, not full communion. Full communion can happen through baptism. But it's full Christian initiation. And that's why the church requires that those who are to be ordained be fully initiated, so having all three sacraments. And those who are to be married should also have all three sacraments, be fully initiated before they can have marriage. The second principle is Canon 866. Unless there is a grave reason to the contrary, an adult who is baptized is to be confirmed immediately after baptism and is to participate in the Eucharistic celebration also by receiving communion. So we see the principle of 842 made more specific in what actually happens when an adult is baptized. They are to be confirmed immediately and then celebrate the Eucharist with the reception of Holy Communion. An important question also for us at the beginning is who is the RCA intended for? Canon 852, paragraph 1 says, The prescripts of the canons on adult baptism are to be applied to all those who, no longer infants, have attained the use of reason. Paragraph 2, a person who is not responsible for oneself, non sui campos, is also regarded as an infant with respect to baptism. So the RCA deals with those who are over the age of seven and who have the use of reason. That's a big issue for a lot of pastors and parishes where we have these children who were not baptized in infancy. They're now over seven. What do we do with them when they want to become Catholic or when their parents want them to become Catholic? Well, because they're over seven, they have to go, now go through the rite of Christianization for adults, although for children of catechetical age, which we're not really going to deal with today either. But that's what the, that's what the law says. They are equated as adults for initiation purposes. Yes? Sure. While we're listening to you, should we assume that everything you say about children, I mean adults, also applies to children? Or there are dis are there distinctions? Because it is the same process. People have a bad habit call it RCIC, like which does not analysis. exist. That's what not exist. That's like right. Else on a blackboard to me. <laughs> <laughs> and it actually would really not know what you're talking about when you say things like that. But I'm just wondering. Is it basically the same for adults and children, or are there distinctions that the, you don't the, have time to address? Yeah, the, the, the children of catechetical age right in part two of the RCA deals with those exceptions that happen when children are initiated from the age of seven to roughly through 13. RCA for adults really begins about 14 or so in the, in the mind of the church. And where would I find that? Uh, part for children? Yeah. 
in your RSA book? Part two. It's in part two. The regular initiation for adults is part one. And then part two deals with those exceptional circumstances, the first of which is children. Mm -hmm. And then the second um, for our intended audience is Canon 851. The celebration of baptism must be properly prepared. Consequently, number one, an adult who intends to receive baptism is to be admitted, and I even give you the Latin there, admittitor, to the catechumenate, and is to be led, I left that Latin off, but it's producator, insofar as possible, through the various stages to sacramental initiation, according to the order of initiation adopted by the Conference of Bishops and the special norms issued by it. Canon 851 makes clear that an adult who is not baptized is to be admitted to the catechumenate. That's a requirement. And then, what's quantified with the insofar as possible, are the various stages that follow after that. But the church expects that adults who come to us who are not baptized, indeed are admitted to the catechumenate, and then are to be led insofar as possible through the other stages. So we're, those are our general principles that we're going to work from now as we look at who the players are and what happens. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you, we have a situation right now where we have a couple of unbaptized adults who have been participating in most of our CIA for a few months. They've been going to uh, classes. They've been breaking open the Word. For whatever reason, they were never admitted to the catechumen. We never did a mm -hmm. right for them. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure and, and I think they should be coming into the church this Easter vigil. So we should do a catechumen. Are you saying they should they be admitted to the order of catechumens? Yes. Some, okay. Yep. And since next week's the right of election, I would do it like tomorrow. <laughs> 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 It'll be a short catechumen, but nevertheless, yes. Okay. Now, some related documents that are not, you know, you need to have more than just the rights. The rights book, or CIA, this is my study guide, well beat up. But some other things you want to have would be the infant right of baptism, because of course all baptism is related in the church, and so it's important to know what else the church says about baptism, especially as it concerns the infants. The right of confirmation, which came out in 71. The Roman Missal, which in the Latin version came out in 2002, we of course have the 2011 version. The Code of Canon Law. And then most particularly and probably the most often overlooked are the National Statutes for the Catechumenate, which were promulgated by our own Conference of Bishops in 1986. And they are particular law for the dioceses of the United States when it comes to initiation of adults. And they are found in the back of the RCA book. Now, first major thing to discuss in terms of the canonical issues are who are we talking about? Who are the players? First of all, we're going to look at the ministers of initiation. The right says that the Christian community, the assembly, initiates new Christians. That's an important thing that we probably, a lot of people that don't understand in the parish, when they come to the 9 o'clock Mass, they say, oh no, <laughs> not that again. <laughs> But we've got to help them understand that they, are, they have a role in helping to initiate new members. The more we can do that, the more we can help then be welcoming communities for those who in fact come into the church. Among specific players, we have to mention two, sponsors and godparents. And there is a distinction between sponsors and godparents. Sponsors are mentioned in the RCIA, and specifically in number 10. And their duty is to accompany any candidate seeking admission as a catechumen. They stand as a witness to the candidate's moral character, faith, and intention as they're making that journey through from pre-catechumenate through catechumenate up to the right of election. They are persons who have known and assisted the candidates. There really are no other requirements. I would hope that these people would be Catholic. But the rights doesn't specifically call for that, although I can, think you can make an argument that, they, that they, they should be and are. They work, these sponsors, from the right of acceptance through the entire period of the catechumenate, so really up to the Easter Vigil. So they're going to dovetail a little bit with godparents we're going to look at next. Another person takes over as godparent for the period of purification and enlightenment and for mystagogy. In the Code of Canon Law, in our current English translation, it calls 
what are truly godparents, the English translation is sponsors. And that's a bit confusing because the right is clear in the Latin that sponsors in the RCA process are not godparents. And godparents are not necessarily sponsors. So we're making that distinction here. Sponsors are those who accompany our catechumens through the process. And then we move to godparents. And the right deals with them in RCA number 11, but also in the Code of Canon Law. Godparents accompany the candidates on the day of election when they specifically give testimony to the community about their candidates. And they also, godparents, accompany the candidates at the celebration of the sacraments of initiation at the Easter Vigil. And of course, throughout the period of mystagogy. Their function is to show the candidates how to practice the gospel in their personal and social lives. They're to sustain the candidates in moments of hesitancy. They're to bear witness to what it means to be a Catholic Christian. And of course, they guide the candidates' progress in the baptismal life, which deals with their mystagogical aspect. How are godparents selected? They're chosen by the candidates on the basis of good example, good qualities, and friendship. They could also be delegated by the local Christian community, and they have to be approved by the priest, according to RCA number 123. How many godparents can a catechumen have? Well, there is to be only one male sponsor or one female sponsor or one of each, according to the universal law of the church. We should note that in the Eastern Code, there is no restriction placed on the number of uh, godparents. But the Latin Code does. One male, one female, or one of, one of each. The RCA tends to speak of sponsors' godparents in the singular for each candidate, but the rite of baptism of children speaks of one or, or, one or the other or both. So, I mean, you, if, if a catechumen really wanted to have a godmother, godfather, that would be perfectly acceptable, even though the rite envisions only one. Qualifications. Now, here's a big canonical issue for a lot of people, not maybe so much with adults, but more with children, infants who are being baptized. Canon 874 is the one we have to go to for this, because it lists the canonical requirements to be a godparent. And this would apply to infants as well as to adults. To be permitted to take the function of sponsor, in the English translation, a person must, and here we're going to go to number two, have completed the 16th year of age, unless the diocesan bishop has established another age, or the pastor or minister has granted an exception for a just cause. 16 is new in the, in the 83 code. It was 14 in the 1917 code. One could be a godparent. So it's actually been raised. But again, the canon does allow the pastor or the minister to admit one of a lower age. But that age, canons tend to agree, should never be lower than 14 because that was the age in the old code. Paragraph th number three, rather. This godparent must be a Catholic who has been confirmed and has already received the Most Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist and who leads a life of faith in keeping with the function to be taken on. Catholic means they're baptized, at least, and they have to be confirmed and a celebrated Eucharist. So we want somebody who is fully initiated to be a godparent for somebody who is coming into the church. Unless, you, unless you're fully initiated yourself, how can you do that for somebody who isn't and will be? It's important to note that godparents work for the church. This is an issue more, again, for infants being baptized rather than for adults. When parents say, well, I want my brother-in-law to be a godparent, I don't care what the church says. He's going to take care of my son if I die, which is generally not true these days anyway, as it was in the old days. But godparents work for the church. They don't work for the parents. They don't work for the candidate. The church has the right and duty to define the qualifications needed to be a godparent. Because being a godparent is an ecclesiastical office. Being a godparent is an ecclesiastical office. Now, Can I ask you sure. Um, so there should be a Catholic who has been confirmed, has received the Holy Sacrament, who leads a life of faith. It doesn't say that they're a regular member of the parish. They, they would not have to be regular members of the parish. No, of any parish. Well, they, de facto, they are members of a parish by where they live. If they're Catholic and, have, and live somewhere, which means they're okay, alive, that, yes, 
Now, that's why the second part of the sentence is so important. This is the one where he had the most problems. One who leads a life of faith in keeping with the function to be taken on. What we said that the, one of the functions of a, a godparent is to be a good example of the Catholic faith. That means a practicing Catholic. So if you have... Well, they're coming to us for initiation. So therefore they have to abide by what the church's understanding of what that means. Exactly. Examples of not leading the faith, and this is probably where it's easier to say what's not leading the faith and what is, would be not regularly participating in Sunday Eucharist. If you're a Catholic and you're leading a life of Catholic faith, then you celebrate Eucharist weekly with the assembly. Not being validly married in the church is not leading a life of faith for the role to be taken on. And I have to admit, that's been the biggest single issue that I've dealt with as a priest over the years. Um, of people who choose as godparents those who are not very validly married in the church. Well, Father X let me do it. Well, I'm sorry, but Father X did you a disservice in letting that person be a godparent in this case. Number four, godparents cannot be bound by any canonical penalty, legitimately imposed or declared. Uh, so a godparent can't be under any canonical censure. For laity, that would be an interdict or an excommunication. If the godparent's going to be a cleric, that would also include suspension. Um, <coughs> number five, a godparent cannot be the mother or father of the one to be baptized. Parenting and godparenting are different roles. And it doesn't matter how old the catechumen will be, <laughs> his or her mother or father, whether by biologically or even legitimately by law, through adoption, cannot be a godparent. Now there are a couple of exceptions to this canon that we, the church has come with over the years. The first one is for uh, Eastern non-Catholics, what we would generally call the Orthodox, so that's not the most accurate uh, description of them. Eastern non-Catholics. They may be admitted as a godparent, provided the other godparent meets all the requirements of Canon 874. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's a privilege we give to those who are uh, non Eastern non-Catholics. They get to be godparents in name, but they can only be admitted as godparents if, in fact, the other person, the other godparent, is, um, meets all the requirements. Excuse me, mm -hmm. is that only Eastern right, or do we, do, can we accept like a Lutheran or a... No. These are Eastern non-Catholics. They're not, they're not, they are, they're, that's, that's right, they're going to be the next paragraph, paragraph two. Eastern, the same rules for them to be participating in their faith, they require them, right? For the Eastern non-Catholics? Um, one would think it would be the case, but the law doesn't go into that. It is, we, we find this privilege given in the ecumenical directory. Uh, but that would not specifically, we would hope that would be the case, obviously, they would be participating, but it may not be true. Yes. In connecting the two as far as sponsors and godparents, mm -hmm. um, just to make sure I'm clear. So with a sponsor um, that is with the person on their journey uh, before the right of election and the initiation, that's when the godparent takes over. Can <coughs> the sponsor then become the godparent? If, were, if, that got, if that sponsor meets all the requirements of being a godparent, that person could be named as a godparent, sure. Okay. And that's often, that would probably be the best situation. But it, we, we do realize that there are two different roles, and so two different people could, could have them. Yeah. Now, this paragraph 2 of Canon 874. A baptized person who belongs to a non-Catholic ecclesial community is not to participate except together with a Catholic sponsor and then only as a witness of the baptism. So non-Catholic Western Christians <laughs> would be these witnesses. They can be a witness. But again, they have to be admitted with a Catholic mm -hmm. who does, in fact, serve as the role of godparent. Uh, we have had the question come up frequently of someone who is a Catholic but doesn't meet all of the... The previous practices. requirements are number one. Can they be a Christian witness? Technically, no. No. When, when the church says Christian witness in paragraph 2, it means those who are baptized Christians in the Latin, in the Western church, but are not Catholic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. 
Yeah. Now note, for this person to be a witness, they must have a valid Christian baptism. People will say they're Baptists. But maybe they maybe they were never baptized. They went through exactly they went through a dedication. So you want to make sure if, if you're going to have a true Christian witness that in fact they actually have been validly baptized. Obviously that lets out any non-Christian they can never be a Christian witness because it's Christian's part of the name. Question. Um, for an Eastern Rite Catholic in union with Rome, can do they fit just like Roman Catholic? They are exactly yeah yeah, they, okay. yeah Catholic is Catholic. Okay. Of whether it be Western or Eastern doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. No problem there. Now, just a note for confirmation. Canon 893, paragraph 1, stipulates that confirmation godparents have the same qualifications as baptismal godparents. So if you're ever dealing with Catholics who are coming in and need to be confirmed, they have to need a godparent. It's the same requirements to be a godparent for confirmation. Again, pardon? I thought you were a sponsor for confirmation. No, it's actually, it's godparent too. In the, in the Latin, it's patrino as well. So it's a, it's a godparent too. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. Clear about sponsors' godparents. Yeah. yeah. So if a child was baptized as an infant, they mm -hmm. have a godparent. They mm -hmm. are now approaching the sacrament of confirmation at some point later in their mm -hmm. life. Their canonical godparent from infant is the ideal accompanier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. The church would would encourage that person to be the godparent of confirmation <coughs> to again relate the two sacraments right. together. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be. Yeah, but that's the that's, that's the, right. That would be that would be the best. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, what sometimes happens is that the godparent at baptism maybe shouldn't have been the godparent because of issues, and that situation has not changed, and that makes it a bit awkward. Or the situation does change. Perhaps the person was single, right. and now and, now, and they yeah are not they're going to church or whatever. Yeah, there are all kinds of problems yeah. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now. <laughs> The next group of uh, players are the sacred ministers. The RCA number 34 notes that the bishop is responsible for overseeing and moderating initiation in his diocese. So he, in fact, has the authority to issue a particular law that deals with certain aspects of initiation. Priests, in addition to being the sacramental ministers of initiation, provide pastoral care to catechumens, especially those who are discouraged, the rite says. So our priests should certainly be involved in the whole initiation process. Not only the ritual aspects, but also the catechetical formation aspects. And the rite says, finally, the deacons assist in the ministry to catechumens. The church doesn't say much about deacons. They just assist. Okay. Now, next group, catechists. This is an ecclesiastical office for lay persons only. Once one's ordained to the uh, as a deacon and a, as a cleric. One no longer is te can technically be a catechist as the church understands it. But catechists, because it's an ecclesiastical office, must be appointed by the diocesan bishop or his delegate. They have a direct responsibility in, in handing on the teaching of the church. And of course they're encouraged to participate in liturgical celebrations as well. Catechist is generally a term that the church prefers us to use, and the code does in book three, for those who are leading communities in mission lands. We don't, we don't generally use that term catechist here canonically in that aspect. Um, maybe call the mission lands capital C canonical, and here catechists are like a small c, because we don't use it as an ecclesiastical office, and that's, that's fine. Our next group of players are those who are coming to the church. And here it's important we be clear of the canonical aspects that separate one group of people from another. Catechumens are defined in the National Statutes of the Catechumen at number two as a person who has not been validly baptized and is admitted to the order of catechumens. It's the admission into the order of catechumens that makes one juridically a catechumen. Until that time, they're just an inquirer. But once they go through the rite of acceptance into the order of catechumens, this unbaptized person becomes a catechumen. After baptism, the rite tells us the person is called a convert. That's one of my new pet peeve bugaboos. People, I was a Lutheran, but now I converted. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. You actually converted when you got baptized. <laughs> Because baptism changes you to Christ. Conversion. Becoming a Lutheran to a Catholic didn't change you at all. 
you're ontologically still a Christian. That, that's the big issue. So we, we don't properly speak of converts, of those who are now baptized. Also, interestingly enough, the right says, or national statutes of the catechumenate say, in number six, the catechumenate period should last through one Easter. Now, with the gentleman over here, we have only have a week to go, or seven weeks until Easter. That's not going to work for him. But in point of fact, the church envisions, our own bishops envision, that catechumens are in the catechumenate over a year. How many of us have year-long cate catechumenates? Good, okay. Good, okay, good. Yeah. Well, we, a person should spend an Easter as a catechumen. That's what, the, that's what the church intends. Spend an Easter. That's 12 months, 365 days at least, okay? So the catechumens are non-baptized persons. They are distinguished from those who are to be received into full communion with the Catholic Church. This is a person who was validly baptized in a non-Catholic church or ecclesial community. These are validly baptized individuals who were so baptized into a non-Catholic church or an ecclesial community. They are already members of the Church of Christ. They are already one with us in baptism. So they're not catechumens. They're not governed by the RCIA, part one of the ritual. There's another ritual for them. So we've got to be clear about that. And sometimes I know parishes that I've been involved with are not always clear about who's who. You should be able to get a baptismal certificate or attestation of baptism from anybody who is a validly baptized Christian. And it would be, I think, the responsibility of the team to have that on hand so that you know where this person stands. There's a third group of people who often find our, themselves in our processes, and those are the uncatechized adult Catholics, which the National Statutes and the Catechumenate number 25 speak about. This is a person who was baptized as a Catholic, who never received catechetical formation or the sacraments of confirmation and or Eucharist. We might call these the, the makeup Catholics. They're finally coming to us to finish off the sacraments. But they're already Catholics, they're with us in full communion, but they don't have full initiation. And those people often also find themselves in our RCA processes. You said or. Does that mean? Or confirmation or Eucharist? No, they, no, no formation or. They oh, yeah, it could be either one. It, so, it really could so be either adults one. adults who have had no formation. If they're Catholic. Really if, if they're Catholic. Yeah, we, we have to recognize their. No, who have their sacraments. Oh, I see. Oh, I'm glad you're saying. Is No, but doesn't the um, church presume if you've been received the sacraments of confirmation and Eucharist, you are considered to have had basic catechesis? Yeah. yeah. In, in theory, because those confirmation and Eucharist would require catechesis on their own. So if you've had at least some catechesis then, so you're not uncatechized. Yeah. Right, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's yeah. a sort of, yeah. I think, very narrow understanding of catechesis, but it, yeah. they had Yeah, it's minimal. It's, it's, yeah. But they have but, yeah. The, one yeah. Had, the last time they ever saw a church was a day they <laughs> <laughs> Yes. How about the, the person who's received Eucharist and has become has been coming to church, mm -hmm. but hasn't received confirmation yet? They would be in this last group, uncatechized adult Catholics, because they really are coming for confirmation. Okay. Yeah. Now, <coughs> good. <laughs> well, they, they, they they are really coming for confirm. They're coming for confirmation. Yeah, so, they're the, not in that group. so they well, they're uncatechized. They fall under this uncatechized adult Catholics. I like they don't belong to the Now, I, I think juridically they would be because they're, here, they're really doing sacramental prep. Now, here's the, issue, here's the point I want to make, though. In the perfect parish, which of course I know we all come from the perfect parish, <laughs> these are three separate groups. Catechumens, they have their own group in meet a catechesis. The, those for full reception, they have their own group. They meet separately, away from the catechumens. And finally, this group of makeup Catholics, they meet on their own too. So, unfortunately, what happens is our parishes don't have the depth of bench to get all these groups going, and so we put them into one big group. And we do what we can through the process. But that's not really what the church envisions. It envisions each group being its, in its own 
process, journey, as it were. First in the back. Uh, yes. Uh, can or should uh, these last two groups, those with full communion mm -hmm. and uncategorized, can they or should they be included in the right of acceptance? No. No. The right of acceptance is only for those who are unbaptized. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Actually, for, and for those who come into full communion, there's a separate right for them, which we're going to deal with maybe next year. <laughs> if, if, I, if I get invited back. Yes. Okay, just in my own mind to clarify, because I know the AMS, the bishop says, um, Catholics returning to the church should absolutely not be put in RCIA. And that's always been a real sticking point for me because... I was always involved in things like landings and remembering mm -hmm. church and stuff. And so for me to put them together is just insane. It goes against everything I think. Well, we always manage to get a couple people every year that are, for all intents and purposes, fully functioning Catholics. And when the community finds out that, you know, so-and-so was never confirmed and now she's standing up there, they just about kind of topple over. <laughs> Those yeah. people should not be in the RCIA class in the process with the catechumens and the candidates, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. That's the, that's the, the, that's the full vision. Yes. Mm -hmm. In part because the catechesis is different and it doesn't need, right. to, be, it doesn't need to be extensive. Right. We're and doing the, sacramental prep for confirmation. We're not doing conversion to Christ right. in the RCIA. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. To be confirmed, you don't have to have a doctorate in sacred theology. <laughs> And sometimes we do that for our kids. Oh, we've got to have two years, all this stuff. Just confirmation, get them going to church. That's the important thing. Yes? Except for the RCI, for the catechumens and the candidates coming for full communion, does the parish priest actually have the faculty to confirm those, those adults? Group three? Yeah. No, he does not. He would need to have the faculty given to him by the diocesan bishop. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that ought to be that, well, you, you should be, but yes, that's true. Yeah. Okay, any questions on the players? Okay. Yes. Regarding sponsors and godparents, uh, inasmuch as they work for the church, would it be possible for somebody to litigate against the church if they were to abuse their godchild? In other words, how seriously do we take that, that they really work for the church? When I say work for the church, I'm talking ecclesiologically is an ecclesiastical office. Um, and I, uh, yeah. Uh, um, and I don't, yeah, I'm not giving any thought to that issue. Yeah. Sounds like conversation in front of a lawyer. Yeah. Yes. Every year I seem to get one of my two or three catechumens who manages not to be present at the right of acceptance. And pastoral resistance to doing it again the next week for just one mm -hmm. person. So, do you know, if they would have, should, would have, should have been there, can we call them a human or like... Um, why not do it during daily Mass? Why do it at Mass? Generally, why, you could also do it outside of Mass. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, do, yeah, you could also do it one evening with the rest of the group that's there. Have the pastor come in and, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. It'd be perfectly fine, too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's spend the balance of our time looking at the rights and their canonical requirements. Now, this is going to be a very brief overview, um, just so we're clear about it again, okay? Remember, Canon 851 requires that adults be admitted to the catechumenate and celebrate the various stages insofar as possible. The RCA speaks of periods and steps. Um, those of you familiar with Ron Oakham's uh, mm -hmm. work, uh, one, of the, one of the table, gives the idea of, of the suspension bridge, where the, the roadbed is the journey. And the, the suspension bridge is held up in part by the pillars that stand that are, happen every thousand feet or so. Those are the rights. Those are the steps. And then what happens in between those steps, that roadbed, those are the stages that the, the person goes through. Those are the catechetical moments, as it were. And I give you there those various steps and stages. Now, of course, we know that not everybody fits into this one-size-fits-all right. And so there are exceptions. Number, number 331 of the RCA says, exceptional circumstances may arise in which the local bishop in individual cases 
can allow the use of a form of Christian initiation that is simpler than the usual complete rite. It goes on to say, the extraordinary circumstances in question are either events that prevent the candidate from completing all the steps of the catechumenate, or a depth of Christian conversion and a degree of religious maturity that lead the local bishop to decide that the candidate may receive baptism without delay. Notice who makes the decision here. The diocesan bishop does. It doesn't say pastor. It doesn't say parochial vicar who's in charge of RCIA. It doesn't say RCA coordinator. It's the diocesan bishop. It's part of his oversight for Christian initiation. So if an individual feels that he or she should have this exception, he or she should write a letter to the bishop explaining why. Now, it wouldn't hurt for the pastor, RCA coordinator, to write supporting letters. They can all go in together in the same envelope to the diocesan bishop and let him make the decision about what should happen. So that's a privilege asked for by the individual. Yeah. In theory, the pastor could also write it on behalf of the individual, but it's all, I think it's always nice to have the individual himself or herself write the bishop and say, you know, this is my... I'm going to be gone for the second scrutiny. So I'm asking to be dispensed from one of the three. Yeah, that's, you know, why you're going to be gone, whatnot. And then others can write other supporting documents. What's the canonical number for that? Um, that's in 331. RCA 331. And do bishops often get letters like this? Um, I know when, when I was in Stockton, we got a fair number. And I always, if people call me asking questions, I said, well, this is what you got to do. Just write. And um, you know, we're bringing it up to the bishop, and he makes a decision. I, I fear that in, in a lot of places it doesn't happen. Because the pastor just says, well, that's okay, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> but canonically, that's not what's supposed to happen. <coughs> so we know that the first, step, the first step is the right of acceptance into the order of catechumens. This only involves unbaptized persons. Now there's a caution to priests here. It is the duty of parish priests, pastors, to see that no baptized person seeks for any reason whatever to be baptized a second time. We probably all know people who've gone through initiation, but probably as uh, Western non-Catholics, who so much like the group they're with, and they want to see all, they really want to feel baptism. So, well, just I'll go through the whole thing, and you can baptize me. No, we're not acting here. This is about ontology. You will, you will be changed. Baptism has already changed you, and so therefore, this is only for the unbaptized. RCA 42 gives the criteria: there must be evidence of a first faith that was conceived during the period of evangelization and pre-catechumenate, and indeed an initial conversion, initial conversion, an intention to change their lives and enter into a relationship with God in Christ. Who does this discernment of dispositions for somebody who's ready to go into the catechumenate? It's up to the sponsors, catechists, deacons, and pastors. Those who know the catechumenate they would be catechumen. They're the ones who decide, okay, this person's ready for the catechumenate. And if not, well, then you'll be around for the next catechumenate. You know, sometimes we all grow at our own paces. God's grace works at different stages in everybody's lives. And so if we're aware of that and we pay attention to that, we can make good discernment uh, issues. Uh, the liturgical celebration is found in number 44 of the RCIA. The rite should take place on days specified during the year. Two or three days can be chosen well in advance. And I know from RCA work in the past that uh, somebody's gone through the whole lectionary cycle and picked out three or four days in the course of each liturgical year, A, B, and C, as to what would be good gospels and good readings, which are good days for parishes to celebrate the rite of election or the rite of order of acceptance. It's a priest or deacon who presides at the uh, order of acceptance in the catechumenate. And note what happens after one goes through the rite. The catechumens are now a part of the household of God. They're on their way, they're like in the, in the entryway of the church. And they now have a new juridic status in the church by being catechumens. They have access to the word of God and liturgical celebrations, such as sacramentals, certain anointings, exorcisms, etc. And the church gives them prerogatives. They don't get rights. Only the baptized have rights. But catechumens have prerogatives. They can be married in the church, and they can be buried in the church. 
kind of like a parochial vicar almost, <laughs> except, for, except for marriage. <laughs> yes. They are obliged now to divine law. And, but since they're not Catholics, they're not bound by merely ecclesiastical laws in Canon 11. Because to be bound by a merely ecclesiastical law, one must be a Catholic. And technically, they're not Catholics yet. Are they considered Christians at that point? No, you're not, not a Christian until you're baptized. You've got to go through the waters of new life. But if they were to die in the catechumen and fall, then, they, then, then they are baptized the, by blood. Oh, no, but by, by desire. desire. By desire. That, that would be that would in theory be yes, yes, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, they can go through Christian burial, although using the words that speak of their non-baptism. Yeah. Now, here's an interesting point that a lot of people don't recognize: is that there is to be a register of catechumens maintained in each parish. Our say number forty-six. Who has a register of catechumens? Amen. You have one? Yes, because the Diocese of Richmond mandates it. Good, <laughs> excellent. You got, okay. Excellent, good, okay. Yeah, because how are we going to know in the future if somebody that never gets baptized, but oh, he was a catechumen? We've got to have some way of knowing that this person actually was a, is a catechumen at that point. Because they have a juridic status, that's right. Yep, okay. The next ritual is the rite of election or enrollment of names, which of course most of us will celebrate next week. The focus here is to close the period of the catechumenate, and it marks the beginning of the final period of more intense preparation for the sacraments of initiation. <coughs> Who does the election? The church does. The church elects, chooses the catechumens for the celebration of the sacraments of initiation at the next Easter. This is done after receiving the testimony of godparents and catechists and the catechumen's own reaffirmation of their desire and intention to receive baptism. At this point, catechumens are expected to have undergone a conversion in mind and in action, and to have developed a sufficient acquaintance with Christian teaching, as well as a spirit of faith and charity. And of course, they get all that through the catechumenate. That's why the church wants, our bishops want a catechumenate that goes at least 12 months. Because it takes a long time for somebody to be converted to Christ and to learn all of what that means. Um, before the rite of election, the bishop, priests, deacons, catechists, godparents, and the entire community, in accord with their respective responsibilities and in their own way, should, after considering the matter carefully, arrive at a judgment about the catechumen's state of formation and progress. Number 121. So here we make a second judgment. And as the RCA number 75 says, that judgment is made, um, it involves four different pillars, as it were, liturgy, uh, charisma, service, and fellowship, koinonia. Those are the four pillars on which we judge whether these catechumens are ready to celebrate the sacraments of initiation at Easter. For the rite of election, the bishop is the normative presider, although it could be delegated to another to a bishop, to a, to a presbyter, or to a deacon. As we noted earlier, this is the time that godparents exercise their ministry for the first time. They are called at the beginning of the rite to come forward with their catechumens, and they give testimony on behalf of this person. Why should this person be chosen to, be, to receive the Easter sacraments? And of course, they may sign the Book of the Elect with the sponsor, the godparent may sign the book of the elect with the, with the catechumen. The catechumen certainly signs the book of the elect, but the um, sponsor, godparent, may. Usually, the rite of election is celebrated the first Sunday of Lent, which would then follow with initiation at Easter. But the rite can also be celebrated in the week preceding or following the first Sunday of Lent. Has anybody here already celebrated a rite of election? Who has more than one? First Sunday, second Sunday? Yeah, some, some big dioceses have to break it up that way. Yeah. For the first year, uh, the AMS, the Military Archdiocese, is going to have its own right of election of Washington at our pastoral center. And we're inviting um, those installations in the immediate Washington area to send their catechumens to the right of election. Which we're kind of looking forward to that next week. Yes? That's an optional right the parish can use before the right of election. Whether that earlier that morning if the right of election is in the afternoon, or previous Sunday. Mm -hmm. That's uh, going be optional. Mm -hmm. The right of election is normally celebrated in the cathedral church, but it could be in the parish church or some other suitable place. 
I know out west where I'm from, Los Angeles and other dioceses have it in the big community center because they can't get everybody. They got so many people, they can't get them all in the cathedral. According to the right, the right of election is celebrated in mass. But that's probably not our general experience. We probably just celebrate it outside of mass. Yeah. Um, the effect, while the catechumens are now called the elect, juridically they're still catechumens. You do get nothing special by being an elect when it comes to juridic <laughs> obligations or privileges. You just, you're still a member of the elect, a uh, member of the catechumenate, but you're just now called the elect, which symbolizes, I guess, in your parish, it has a year round catechumenate would distinguish those who are going to be baptized at Easter coming up from those who are still in the process to go around again. During that last six weeks or so before the celebration of the sacraments of initiation, the right um, RCIA has a few rights that belong to this period. Most important for our purposes are the scrutinies. The scrutinies, uh, according to the right, are meant to uncover, then heal all that is weak, defective, or sinful in the hearts of the elect, to bring out, then strengthen all that is upright, strong, and good. The scrutinies are basically exorcisms in preparation for the sins that will be forgiven them in their baptism. You know, we know that those who are baptized as adults get all their sins forgiven. Well, some would say, well, how do we know they're ever sorry for them? How do they know they want to be forgiven? It's the scrutinies that do that. That's the purpose of the scrutinies, is to do those exorcisms that deal with the issues that are in those Gospels, light, life, water, etc. The presider can be a bishop, a priest, or a deacon. It's celebrated on Sunday, normally third, fourth, and fifth Sundays of Lent. Um, it's celebrated within Mass. And the readings that are used are those for year A. No matter when the scrutinies are celebrated, they are always the year A Gospels, even outside of the season of Lent. Um, the scrutinies are required. This is the big canonical issue here. The scrutinies are required. The diocesan bishop, according to RCA 34.3, says the diocesan bishop can, quote, dispense on the basis of some serious obstacle from one scrutiny, or in extraordinary circumstances, even from two. What can he not dispense from? All three. <laughs> he can dispense from one, or even more possibly two, but never all three, yes. All right, we have a gentleman who um, is, he's actually going to be baptized tomorrow at five o'clock mass. And he's been in the order of catechism. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to miss all the scrutinies. And the reason why he's going to be baptized tomorrow is because he's in the military and due to leave for a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here's where you get into AMS particular law and what can happen because of the military situation where guys are immediately leaving. Um, and that would be one of the cases where the diocesan bishop can, in fact, make other provisions about what needs to be done. Um, and in the AMS, the archbishop has delegated the chaplains, the AMS priest who's there, to make those decisions. Because obviously we can't worry about everybody else in the world. But that's what would happen. Now, when did you know he was going to leave? Uh, I actually found out, uh, probably about two and a half months ago. Yeah, see, well, probably what I would have done in that case is backed up then, done a right of election with him six weeks before, and then the, the th what would be the third, fourth, and fifth weeks before his baptism tomorrow mm -hmm. is done the scrutinies at that point. So all those processes should have taken place. Mm -hmm. They just moved up to his, his, to his time, yeah, as, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, we know, that all, you know, obviously, if somebody's baptized, initiated in danger of death, we're not doing... Right. Catechumen at right of election. <laughs> Three scrutinies. Oh, 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 he just died. <laughs> you know, we, we didn't make it. <laughs> you know, we, we, obviously, so you, you get the point. Yes, sir. He's going to be baptized tomorrow? What about the other Yeah, I, are, you, are you in the military installation? 
Yeah. Yeah. Just, you're already civilian parish. Yeah. He, he is, he's unbaptized. <laughs> Right. And so he's been in the order of catechumen. Right. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, is, is he just going to be baptized tomorrow? Or will he have confirmation of first communion? No, he'll have it all. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I was presuming the law was being followed and everything else. <laughs> now let's move on. We're getting close on time here. Um, finally, the sacraments of initiation in the cells. Obviously the purpose here is to celebrate baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. This happens at the Easter Vigil. Note the Easter Vigil begins after nightfall. That is about 45 minutes after sunset. It can, has to conclude before dawn on Easter Sunday. Now most people are well in bed by then, but there are some parishes actually that wait until they do start it at 3 o'clock in the morning. But it has to be finished by dawn. So you, you, either way, you can do what you like to do. Um, it's normally celebrated in a church, or it could be celebrated in an oratory as well. The bishop is the preferred presider for those who are over 14, but that's really unpractical, and most priests and dioceses have been authorized to baptize those who are over the age of seven. Um, the texts that are used will be the proper text for Easter Vigil. Outside the Easter Vigil, we would use the proper text for Christian initiation for baptism, which are found in the lectionary. Of course, the initiation occurs after the blessing of water, and of course, as we've already said, adults are confirmed after their baptism. In this case, the explanatory rite of anointing with chrism is omitted for adults. They're only anointed once, and that would be in confirmation. Again, Canon 866, we saw this at the beginning, says, unless there is a grave reason to the contrary, an adult who is baptized is to be confirmed immediately after baptism and is to participate in the Eucharistic celebration also by receiving communion. Father, what about the children between the ages of 7 and 13? Are they adults for initiation purposes? Yes. Yes, they are. Therefore, they have to be confirmed. Yep. Yes. Even though their parents don't want them to, it's not their option. They chose to delay their child's baptism until after the age of reason, making them adults. They've already made their option. Therefore, now they have to abide by the discipline of the church. That would also include then, like, if a child, you know, a Catholic school scenario, a second grade parent family comes in and says, oh, well, my child was baptized Methodist, you know, okay. then we want them to make communion. <laughs> you know? Okay, so in that case, then you receive the child into the church, yes. confirm them, because you, cause you got to confirm them, and then they celebrate First so Communion. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let's see where are we? The effects. Well, I think we're pretty good on the effects. In baptism, catechumens receive pardon for their sins, and they are admitted to the people of God. They are graced with adoption as children of God, and are led by the Holy Spirit to the promised fullness of time begun in Christ. And now they share in the Eucharistic sacrifice in their priesthood role. That, of course, that leads to the period of mystagogy, which we're all still on together. And at this point, neophytes should participate in the principal Sunday Eucharist of the community throughout the Easter season. As a body, in company with their godparents and those who have assisted in their Christian formation. Easter Vigil is not graduation. It continues on. They, they can't let go of each other yet. They need to continue in that period of mystagogy after initiation. Now, in our last few minutes together, I just want to hit on a, some record-keeping issues because these have canonical ramifications as well. Sacraments of initiation affect the juridic status of persons in the church. Are they Christian or not? Are they Catholic or not? People need full proof of initiation for, to enter the seminary, to get married in the general norm, as well as to be godparents. Um, Pastors are given the responsibility to ensure the accuracy of their sacramental registers. But of course, they're only going to get the information from you, probably, involved in RCAA. So you need to make sure your records are in order to make sure the pastor can update their parish registers. A couple of registers that are required. First, the baptismal register. Canon 877, paragraph 1, says that the name of the baptized, the name of the minister, the person's parents, Regardless of how old the person being baptized is, his, his or her parents' names go in the register. They may be dead and gone, but their names still go in the register. 
the names of the godparents, witnesses if any, place and date of the conferral of baptism, and the person's place and date of birth. All those things go into the baptismal record. Then that record becomes what I call the clearinghouse record for the rest of their lives. Because we note other things that happen to that person sacramentally or juridically in the church. When they're confirmed, the church of baptism will be notified to put a notation of their confirmation. When the person's married in the church, the church of baptism will receive notification of that marriage. It goes in the notations column. If the person's adopted, that will go in the, bapt- in the notations column. If the person receives holy orders or perpetual religious profession, that goes in the baptismal register in the notations column. And if they change ritual church from, say, Latin to Maronite or any of those kind of combinations, that also goes in the baptismal register. Unfortunately, the notations column is about that big per person. (laughs) It's okay to add things in the back or in in a file in the church. But those are things that need to be noted in the baptismal register. Notations are always included on the baptismal certificate, except if the law says otherwise. And one place the law does say otherwise deals with adopted children. That will be one place where, in fact, uh, we would not necessarily note the fact of adoption on a baptismal certificate. Uh, our own conference has particular law dealing with the notation of children and who have been adopted. Um, and I give you the website there that you can go if you need to look that up. It's very helpful. Another register is the confirmation register. This includes the name of those confirmed, who the minister was, the parents, the godparent, and the place and date of conferral of confirmation. Now note, it's the, per- it's the minister. This is important to keep in mind if you've got two different ministers confirming, even if, it, even if it's the bishop, and he wants to associate another presbyter with him, the bishop didn't confirm everybody. So you've got to keep track of who got confirmed by the presbyter and who got confirmed by the bishop. <laughs> because a different minister would go in the, in the sacramental register. Yes? Is that why Archbishop Romeo is the only presider when he does confirmation downtown? Because um, I know the first year we had like 150 people yeah. being confirmed. It was, it, it was his decision not to associate. That's entirely his decision. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's really up to the, um, it's up to the Minister of Confirmation to determine at what point is he going to have an associate with him. And Archbishop Broly prefers to do all the confirmations. So he does. Yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yep. No, it's a fact of confirmation. So and so was confirmed, and that's my next point. Notification of confirmation is sent then to the church of baptism. If it's the same church, you just go put it in that red baptism register, which makes it easy or difficult because you've got to do two two registers now, or you do a form that you send to the church of baptism, and then they're supposed to send it back to you that told you that it happened. But uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly, yes, exactly. Yeah, we don't worry about that. What happens if the church of baptism doesn't? Exist? Uh, there, should, the, 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 there, there should be a play that you call the chancery of the diocese and they'll tell you where those records are kept. Yeah. Uh, we've already spoken about the register of catechumens. This is kept because the right of acceptance confers juridic status. What's included in this? The name of the catechumen, minister, sponsors, and date of celebration. Uh, we've mentioned the book of the elect. Here catechumens write their name in the book of the elect. And godparents can also write their name. One register we haven't spoken about, and this is just a little bit off the topic a little bit, is the register of those received into full communion. RCA 486 mentions this register. It can be easy to miss when you're looking at the right. Here we want to include the names of the ones received and the date and place of the conferral of their baptism, which of course will be a non-Catholic baptism. So Grace Lutheran Church, whatever it happens to be. Of course, it would also be good to include the minister of baptism, the parents, godparents for baptism, if there were any, the minister who received this person into the Catholic Church, godparents or sponsors for that event, the reception of the full communion, the date and place of reception, and the date and place of birth. 
oftentimes we end up using our baptismal registers to function as this register for those who are received. But in point of fact, the RCA requires a separate register. And I think a couple of companies are now publishing them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we, we should really be adding those into our thing as well. Again, this, this, re this, right of re this reception register becomes that person's baptism equivalent in the Catholic Church. So when they're confirmed, but notification goes in the notations column of this register. If they become a priest or get married or in a religious life, it goes back to this register then. So it functions in much the same way. We're actually out of time, but any last minute questions? Yes? Uh, in some what is um, coming into full view with the church, and they, they were uh, Presbyterian, they have a child that's five years old that was also baptized Presbyterian. Um, what happens with that child? Uh, if it's the parent, child it, just take first communion when they turn seven? If it's the parent's wish that that child become Catholic at the same time that he or she is, mm -hmm. then that I would bring the, both of them in together. But they're, they're and that, but, you, but then you would not confirm because they're not an adult, mm -hmm. and then you would just put them through the normal process of but first communion, and then does have to be accepted. All yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. make a profession of faith. Well, they can't because he's five. Yeah. Oh. So, so his, that's why, on the basis of the parents and parents, exactly. That's what would happen. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Father, child, age three or four, goes into the Catholic school, was not baptized as a Catholic, but is of Catholic parents. Okay. They assume that the child now is Catholic. Catholic. Do, when they reach the age of seven, we don't have to put them through an RCIA prop. We do. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's why once they become seven, the church requires, as because they're now an adult for initiation purposes, the church requires that unbaptized persons so are no equated. So there's no canonical assumption that no. because they put them into a Catholic school. No. Nope. That'll be great for their religious education. So the, the catechesis will be not an issue. It's the ritual stuff that's going to be the issue. That we want to make sure that they are catechumens and everything happened. Can they make a profession of faith on behalf of the child? Well, we're, we're talking now. We're, we're talking now over the age of seven, though. Yeah, no, no, I'm talking about a child who is three or four, and they're put into a like, kind of like kindergarten. Oh, yes. at that point, then they can be baptized as an infant. Yeah. yeah. At that they point, were baptized Lutheran as an infant because mom was a Lutheran or dad okay. was a Lutheran. And, and then I would re have them received into the church. Now you may want to, in theory you could wait until they get to be, well, I could see issues against that. I was going to say you could wait until they get to be the age they can actually choose themselves, mm -hmm. but then you've got to confirm them and celebrate First Communion. Yeah. And you may want to get it done earlier so you can continue. Or it's up to the parents. Or the parents need to come in and do Sure, it yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Last question. I know an adult who was baptized Catholic, received communion, reconciliation, went through the program in high school for confirmation, but didn't complete it. How would you deal with him being totally uh, Again, in the perfect parish, I would have a preparation for confirmation, people missing confirmation. But I used to run it in my own par in my parish in Stockton, and it was about six weeks. We met together, and that's all we did. We, that, that's all we did. Yep. But, but again, at this point, I would, as, as an adult now, I would bring them through, just update things, and move on. Has this been helpful? Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. That would have been the whole thing. You're welcome.